The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Generation Life Limited, ABN 68092 843902, AFSL 225 408, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Listening to Strategies to Facilitate Intergenerational Wealth Transfers, a special five part mini series from the Ensemble Podcast. Over five episodes, we talk to authors, practitioners, product providers, and a lawyer to reveal what works and what doesn't for advisors and their clients when it comes to retiring and leaving a legacy. As the pioneer of Australia's first truly flexible investment bond, Generation Life has been at the forefront of providing innovative, tax-effective investment solutions since 2004. As an innovation-led business, Generation Life constantly strives to enhance investment solutions to optimise after-tax investment performance for investors. As a leading specialist provider of tax-optimised investment and estate planning solutions, as well as investment-linked lifetime annuities, Generation Life works closely with financial advisors to secure the financial futures of many Australians and their families. Hello and welcome back to this special XY Advisor podcast mini-series focused on the Retirement Income Covenant and its implications for advisors. I'm Vin Scully, veteran advisor and founder of Life Sherpa, Australia's most affordable financial advice service. In this episode, I chat to Eric Weigel, author of Reimagining Retirement, The Nine Keys to True Wealth. Eric is a certified professional retirement coach and founder of Retire With Possibilities, an advisory and retirement coaching firm based in Boston and dedicated to helping people consciously design their own journey into retirement. He's a fellow baby boomer with three decades of experience and a true powerhouse of knowledge and experience when it comes to dealing with retirees as people, not portfolios. Welcome, Eric. Thanks, Vince. I'm really, really happy to be on your show. Cool. And I know you're just getting into... Uh, Boston winter and yeah. as we head into summer here. But um, maybe start by filling in our audience who are largely advisors uh, a little bit about your practice and in particular what a professional retirement coach is and how that relates to financial advice generally. Yeah, so that, that that's a great question and a question we get quite a bit here in, in the States as well. Re- being a retirement coach is a new thing. Um, it really just, it's really started maybe 10 years ago, but even at this point in time, the number one question we get is, what is it? Um, so it's really, think of a, of a life coach, for example, which has been around for a while. That practice has been around in the U.S. at least. Um, think of it as a life coach that deals primarily with issues confronting people that are planning or in their early stages of retirement. So it goes, in my case, my practice deals with the financial side as well. Uh, Many retirement coaches deal with the non-financial side exclusively, and they leave the financial aspect to financial advisors. I am both, so I actually um, deal with the financial side as well as the non-financial side. But I think that while most people, when they think about retirement, for example, start thinking about their mon- the money issues first, they very quickly gravitate to thinking about what they're going to be doing with their free time once they retire, what their identity is going to be, and a whole host of issues that they've never really anticipated um, when they were in the middle of their working years raising family. So a retirement coach really is um, the work of a retirement coach, in my opinion, the way I run my practice is longer term. Think of me as kind of somebody that helps you, you know, get ready for your Australian Open or for your <laughs> Wimbledon, you know. Mm. But but we're doing this usually three to five years ahead of time. Uh, so when you actually get to the big event, when you retire, you actually have a game plan that you've you've feel emotionally attached to. It's not just a binder in a corner of your of your kitchen somewhere. It's really a plan that you have designed in con- in conjunction with the with the retirement coach 
and it's really your blueprint for this next stage in life. Now, it doesn't mean that that's not going to change. It's not it, because we all change. The world changes. Our needs and wants change. So, in a sense, my job as a retirement coach is to keep helping you along the way. But most of the work is really focused up front before you retire. So, so how far out from retirement would you see that? Is this a five-year, 10-year, a lifetime? I think it's a lifetime, even though that the, they're clearly defined stages um, that people go through. The first stage of retirement is kind of what I call the honeymoon phase. People really look forward to retirement. They 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 have these. They think all this free time is going to be wonderful for them. They might have some travel plans or might have some hobbies, some some things that they want to do. But the reality is that the person you are once you move into retirement is typically the same person you were, let's say, in the ten in the last 10 years of your career. So if you didn't exercise before, just because you have extra time, uh, it doesn't mean that you're going to exercise in retirement. So these are really habits that you need to be forming along the way. And uh, clearly, uh, your health has a huge impact on what you can do. And that's typically why people go through different stages in retirement, starting with sort of the honeymoon phase to more the phase where let let we want to spend more time at home with people, you know, our families, our friends, to the final stage, which is more let's really kind of settle down to a place where we can live independently and sort of really de- derive sort of the fruits of our labor but without having to move too much or, or push ourselves too, too hard. So I do think of it as kind of a lifelong sort of thing, just like our habits and sort of um, how we our lifestyle does change over time depending on what stage of life we're in. Um, but, but the reality is that people really need the most amount of help probably in the five years before and five years after they retire. That's really the critical time period for people to really adopt sort of the lifestyle and habits that will take them take him for the long term. Five to 10 year pre-retirement phase as a opportunity for a consumer or client to change advices. Is that, is that something that, you know, to move from a more accumulation focused advisor to a more specialist like yeah someone like yourself absolutely i i think i think advisors can do both um if, but the reality is that most of the of of our industry has been focused on accumulation right it, both here in the us as well as my understanding of in australia yep around the world globally the the the, the focus of advisors has been accumulation now there are there is a movement here in the us where where um, people are focusing more on the retirement phase, creating retirement income. Typically, advisors, I think it, all, it really depends because a lot of advisors that are, say, baby boomers definitely understand the need to create income in retirement hmm. because they can see the same path going forward for themselves as for their clients. Um, but if, but advisors that are typically focused on the younger generation, let's say the millennials, are really going to be focused on a, on a very different set of issues. So I think that um, it gets a little bit more complicated when you're trying to create retirement income streams mm-hmm. um, in a tax-efficient way, in a, in a more predictable way, um, as opposed to accumulating the money where you do have, you know, bear markets that come and go, but you always have a, a, a long-term horizon in mind. You can always, always um, kind of um, educate your clients that a long-term horizon is actually something very beneficial for them while they're accumulating assets. But when they get to that point where they retire and they actually need the money from their liquid assets to uh, to fund their lifestyle. That's when um, market corrections become incredibly difficult to to deal with. Mm. One of the uh, things that strikes me, um, and I don't know if you see this in the US, but certainly in Australia, we see a lot of 
retirees being reluctant to spend their capital, that they seem very comfortable spending income, but feel reluctant to dip into their capital, as they say it. And so many end up dying with much of their retirement nest egg in place. And the challenge, the challenge to go from being an advisor to accumulators, where we're sort of saying spending bad, saving good for 40 years, and then we now have to change that mindset in a consumer and go, well, actually, spending good, just not too much. And don't bear in mind that you will be consuming some of the tree, not just its fruit. Um, so how, how do you deal with that, that, that challenge? Well, I think, I think it's, it's an issue of education. Um, I think you're absolutely right here in the U.S. We do find that people that have retired um, in, a comfortable, in a comfortable manner usually end up with more capital available to them when when they when they pass on um, because they've been so frugal mm-hmm. and they in a sense um, they, 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 it's hard for them to change their their mindset and I think that's one of the reasons why defining you know yourself who you want to be and who you know I call it your future self is so important. Um, because if you don't take the time to figure out what you what lifestyle you want, who you want to be, why you're doing certain things, I think you'll f- always fall in the trap of looking at the past as your guide. And in the past, as, as you mentioned before, Vince, um, in the past, the, you know, be in your accumulation years, the you know the accepted advice was you know you need to put money away. You can You have to be somewhat frugal uh, and not overspend. And and nobody's advocating overspending in retirement. But what you do find is that people get very attached to balances, um, and they get very very nervous when their capital balances, especially, start drifting down. Um, and which is which is you know too bad because at the end of the day, when you really think about sort of the scarce commodity out there. It's your time. So when you think about it, your time becomes more and more valuable the older you are because you have less of it. So you really should be spending, you, you should be spending money in a way that gives you the most satisfaction. Now, for some people, that may, that may mean not spending much because they, t- they, absolutely enjoy, they, they absolutely enjoy spending time, you know, with their grandkids or, you know, in gardening or, or activities that don't require a lot of money. And then there are those that would love to travel um, and while they still can, while they still have the health, but don't do it because they think that spending ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000 for a nice trip um, is actually going to jeopardize their, their, their retirement long term. Um, and if you just kind of do the math and i know right now global equity markets or global capital markets in general are going through a real tough period um things do get better and there's an average return to for example equities in the u.s which is about 10 mm-hmm. percent so when you actually can educate people that you know if you have a down year in the market, typically there's going to be a recovery. It may not happen next year, but typically we don't have to wait for more. There have been very few decades where um, you actually end up losing money. So spending money in a cautious way and spending money in a right way, which is a huge part also of, of a lot of research and psychology, is really important. So, for example, experiences give you more value for your buck, if you will, than, for example, buying yet another a boat or a car uh, or a bigger house. So I think I think at the end of the day, one of the ways in which I try to convince people to to kind of um, spend their own money in a in a in a cautious way is by incorporating incorporating the angle of you know what is the experience that you want to have. So a lot of people, for example, end up taking like their grandchildren on special vacations mm-hmm. and they don't really seem to care about how expensive those are <laughs> because they're really so looking forward to the experience and end up having such a great experience that um, it's really worth all the money in the world for them. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a challenge. I mean, you and I are both old enough to remember the 1970s. And so uh, a retiree in 1969 um, yeah, would certainly have a very different experience, market experience, from someone retiring in yeah. 2009, 10. Um, and certainly the memory for most um, of our audience um, of the last decade has been one of where markets generally go one way. Great. Um, so, so how you bring that experience to bear and still um, encourage people to feel good about spending some of the capital is, a, I think, a big challenge for advisors going forward. Yes, and, and, and in some cases, advisors don't want people to spend money, <laughs> right? Because it means, in many cases, that you know, the, the fees or the AUM they're charging <laughs> is actually going down. You want a happy client and uh, you want a client that comes back for, let's say, a, 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 an annual review that t talks all about their trip they took, they mm -hmm. took with their grandkids as opposed to somebody that's just needlessly worried about what the economy of the markets are doing. Yeah. So I think I think that's a big part of the evolution of our profession is to really start talking about money, but not just as a way to accumulate the most amount and give you the highest margin of safety uh, so you don't run out of money, but also as a way to enable your life to be fully integrated with your money and actually um, be geared at sort of maximizing the quality of your life. So that sort of takes you to the publication of the, the book, which you call The Nine Keys to, to True Wealth. And one of the things that struck me about the book was very little of it's actually about money. Um, yeah. And, um, I mean, you start the book, um, and I'm just going to read this paragraph, and then we can perhaps talk about it. You, you say, I believe that much of what you hear today about retirement planning is well-intentioned but severely lacking. Too much retirement planning is focused on money without giving much thought to where you want to go in your journey and what would make your life successful. And this, I think, for our advisor audience is the crux of it. Much of the financial advice boils down to unrelatable financial projections. You get a lot of nice looking charts, but what does it all mean? So can you talk a little bit about that and what you think that means for advisors? Yeah, I think things have changed a little bit. Uh, there's a period in time where advisors believed that um, size was the size of a book, um, or the complexity of the discussion with with the client was an indicator of value. Um, and I think now people have realized that you still need to run through all the projections, uh, which are a bit guesses, really. Mm -hmm. You just don't know ex exactly. You don't, the number one guess is how long are people going to live? Mm -hmm. You don't, you, you have, you know, mortality tables, but you know, by definition, we're all different. We're all unique. So, so there, there's, there's, um, a movement in the U S to simplify sort of the financial discussions along dimensions that are, that are more understandable to people. I'll never forget about 10 years ago when I first started on this on this wealth management path I remember talking to um, to some of my friends at the Russell company mm -hmm. um, which deals primarily with very large institutional investors um, they do have mutual funds but their clientele is primarily large institutional investors and explaining to a friend of mine at Russell what I was doing and this person, would, had, I had always valued their input because what they said is, okay, so you're trying to tell people that this portfolio is about eating steak and this other portfolio is, is about eating dog food. <laughs> and I thought that was the funny way to put it, but it made me realize that a lot of times as advisors, we need to translate the money into something that the client actually understands. Mm -hmm. It may not be steak versus dog food, but it could be as simple as um, in my role as an advisor, I talk about all things, including where they're going to live. I try to use the power of imagination 
for them to really think beyond kind of where they are right now and think more broadly, what can your money buy uh, in terms of, you know, the lifestyle that you're looking for? But you first have to spend the time thinking about what is it that you want. And that's, in a sense, a critical part, I think, of advisors going forward, which is going to be, I will manage your money, I will manage your financial picture, but let's do it in relation and the context of what you're trying to achieve in your life. And um, I mean, in some ways, it's reminiscent of um, some of the George Kinder's work, although it takes a very yeah. different approach. And you, you sort of start the the next chapter by talking about, you say that today retirement is more about personal transformation than about money. And that concept of personal transformation, you know, the concept of retiring to something rather than retiring from something. And if you spend any time with the FinCon network or with um, personal finance writers, there's a huge movement of certainly of writers, whether it's flows through to the population generally or not, I guess is the jury still out on that one, but the movement to, you know, financial independence retire early, in particular the retire early side of that equation. And you know the focus of many writers in that space is the nine to five is bad. Um, therefore, you should spend very little so that you can stop working early. And doing that at thirty five or forty is materially different to doing it at sixty, sixty five, or seventy. So when you talk about a personal transformation, is that something more than just trying to replace the meaning and purpose that? a job gives people? I think it is because I think it, it, the number one step is you need to come up with an identity that suits your stage in life. Um, going from having a job, having a place where you know Monday through Friday, your certain hours of a day are dedicated to a certain, to your job, to go to basically an empty calendar where you have the same amount of time, but you don't have any requirements for it, it's actually a very, very difficult thing for most people to deal with. They may not imagine that um, that it's difficult, but providing structure to your day, and I, I, I have found in my own personal life to be very, very different to go from working in a company, for example, to being a, an entrepreneur. Because and, and in a sense, when you retire, you become an entrepreneur, right? You're you're managing your life, um, and you decide. Nobody's going to tell you when to get up. When nobody's going to tell you when to go to bed. Nobody's going to tell you if you know if, if that you're that you're abusing the system. If you take a two hour lunch, mm -hmm. um, you know you you make those decisions, and there's freedom in making those decisions, mm -hmm. but there's also responsibility and accountability to yourself. And I think most people that have had a good professional career kind of hold themselves accountable mm. to not wasting time, uh, maximizing kind of their day. Um, so to suddenly go from, you know, being a good corporate citizen or being going to a job, you know, nine to five, let's say, to suddenly not having that, it's an incredibly diff difficult thing to do. And it requires a new identity, but part of coming up with a new identity is sort of deciding what is it that you want to do. And I, I have this concept in my book where any transition or transformation, if you think about retirement, it starts actually with an ending. Mm -hmm. You're ending that phase of your life where you went to a job, for example. And then uh, there's usually... A, a period where some people are incredibly happy, um, that's a honeymoon phase, but there are others where in an increasingly in the U.S., for example, a lot of retirements are involuntary. Mm -hmm. It's usually a health-related thing or a layoff or, you know, COVID or, or something, something that's beyond their control, and they're not mentally prepared to basically give up on their careers at that point in time. Mm -hmm. So that's when you enter, you, you you have all of these, you deny things, you try to go back to the way things were, but the, the world has moved on, 
you've moved on internally as well, and you enter what I call sort of the the, the messy middle, which is the very difficult part of any transformation, whether you're young or old. And a transformation is always difficult, whether you're a young person or you're, you're older. Um, but the messy middle is basically the time in life when you try a lot of different things. You're not you, you, one day you're really you're really focused and happy about the the way your life is going, and then three days later you say, "No, that's a lot of work, and I'm <laughs> not sure that I have the skills or I want to push myself as hard." Um, because change requires effort, mm -hmm. uh, and and change requires discomfort. And that's what happens in retirement. Um, people, generally society interprets retirement as a, the comfortable period in your life. But for a lot of us that, you know, were, were, were had good corporate careers, um, it's actually a really difficult time to basically no longer be needed mm. in the same way than um, when we were younger. So I think I think it's it's transformation. It it requires a transformation. People that don't go through the transformation are either so burned out physically from from their job and a lot of blue collar labor. People that work in blue collar professions kind of fit in that category. But the audience that I typically tend to deal with are professionals that actually have very sort of very good careers. Um, and that find that they need to do something else. Mm. And it's not about the money in, in most cases. Most of the people that I deal with are fine. They're going to be fine in retirement. They've been, they've been following the rules of society of, of investing and saving. Um, and when they get to the finish line, um, you know, they, you can, you know, you have the victory, you can put a victory mark there. But what, what they haven't really done is figure it out. Okay, what is it? What am I going to do with my time? What's this next phase of life? Because when you actually look at the longevity statistics, retirement is no longer five years or mm. 10 years the way it was, you know, 50 years ago or the way retirement was for our parents. Retirement nowadays can mean 20, 30, possibly 40 years in retirement. I have an uncle that recent, is, is about to turn 94 years old, and I talk about him in a book. He jokes jokes with me because he says he worked 30 years in his career at a bank in Washington, D.C., and now he's been retired almost 34 mm -hmm. years. And he is one of the lucky ones that has a pension. But he, um, he it was very interesting because he actually did tell me recently that he did prepare for the mental side and sort of what he was going to mm -hmm. do with his free time. And I thought that was incredibly forward-looking, especially if you go back 30 years or 34 years when he retires. So, yeah, to move from the actuarial view of living long being a risk to living long being an opportunity, that's a, a bit of a psychological leap that um, many advisors, I think, find quite hard. Yeah, I agree. I think I think somebody I can't remember where this quote came from, but somebody once said that would you rather um, die when you're uh, live a long life and die when you're old, or would you rather die young? And I think most when you actually think about it that way, you rather live a long life and and then you know dying as part of the human condition, right? So I think there's a tremendous opportunity because when you think about um, sort of that span in life, there's nothing magical about retirement at 65, let's say, which is sort of the age that everybody here in the U.S. thinks about at 60. Actually, most people, vast majority of people retire. I think the average age of retirement in the U.S. is 62. Um, but uh, And a lot of that is involuntary, as I mentioned before. But I, I think if you if somebody told you, if somebody told you when you were, let's say, 20 years old, that you had to plan ahead for, let's say, 30 years, you would have done something about that. For a lot of us, it meant getting education, you know, sort of um, kind of following the rules of society, um, getting a good job, you know, forming a family, if, if that came up. But it's interesting that when it comes to 
people reaching age 65 and retiring, while they may have 30 more years to live, for some reason, they actually, most people think that their time is less valuable. And I, I have always argued that actually, if you think about time sort of in, I'm, I'm by background, I'm an economist. I think of time having a value. Uh, I, I think the less of anything that you have, the more valuable it becomes. So, so if you really think about it, let's say you're age 65, you retire from your primary profession. Um, you could have another career ahead of you if you think about, you know, 30 years out. Now, it may not involve the same intensity of your previous career. It may involve, it, it for most people, what that means is having a career more on their terms. So it could involve, you know, in my case, I like geographic uh, flexibility. So I don't have a, an office. I deal with people uh, over Zoom or phone calls, uh, and I like to, it, and I've designed everything to be mobile because I I don't want to be in one place. I don't want to necessarily have to be in downtown Boston on a Friday afternoon in the summer at three o'clock. <laughs> uh, I'd rather be somewhere else. Uh, in all honesty, and I think most of my uh, most of my clients are not even available at that time. So um, which which works out fine, but. So I, I think that there's a mindset change that, that you have to have uh, in terms of looking at, at this as a period of opportunity. On the other hand, from a purely financial standpoint, I definitely get what where the actuaries are coming from because one of the risks is outliving your money. And it, it's a perverse kind of thing, right? It's like, like we all would love to live a long, long time um, and then go quickly. Uh, at least that's my wish. But we don't want to die before our time, right? If if the if if somebody says you're expected to 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 live to 85, I certainly don't want to underperform. <laughs> um, and <laughs> so, um, you know, so and 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 that's where, for example, annuities have come into into play here here in the U.S annuities are becoming more popular for that reason, for longevity risk, right? Because what if you do live longer than what you expect? I think of the mistake that a lot of people make too is that they look at their at, at their genes or their, their family history as the absolute indicator how long they're going to live. And that actually, in the, in the research that... that um, that's been done in the last 20 years in the U.S., genes are about 50-60% of your longevity, and the rest of it is lifestyle. So you could actually end up having pretty poor genes uh, in terms of, you know, for example, when your parents or grandparents died, but actually living a long, long time because you actually have a healthy lifestyle. So I think that people really need to look at that and say, a lot of this is under our control, especially in the early years of retirement, and investing in your health is going to have a huge sort of return that is not financial on the surface, but it does have some financial implications. You've encapsulated these nine keys to true wealth in a new take on net wealth. Can you talk us through your net wealth system? Yeah. So when you write a book or when you talk to clients, you always want to be somewhat memorable. So when I came up with this net wealth framework, the first three letters, N-E-T, N stands for nest or your home, E stands for your earnings or your money, and T stands for, for your time. The first three letters are what I, what I would consider were a lot of, a lot of the financial industry a lot of the retirement industry industry spends their time on. So, for example, when, you know, clearly the money, but also the housing, right? There's a lot of, for example, in the U.S., and I'm sure in, in, in Australia it's the same thing. It's, it's the same thing around the globe. There's always this retirement communities <laughs> um, or, you know, over 55 communities, for example, in the U.S., or... You live in Boston. Oh, you must be planning your moves in Florida, you know, or Arizona. 
Um, so there's there's this tremendous amount of resources available for people to deal with the first three letters of net wealth. Um, and but there are fewer resources and sort of paths or or when you're dealing with kind of what I call the wealth piece, which is sort of what I call the, the, the way you turbocharge your retirement. And that involves work. And again, work is a, it's a W, right? Um, and work is really, it could be for money or it could be, you know, pro bono. Um, but it's something that you commit to some cause and you show up for that. It's more than just uh, it's volunteering as opposed to if you're not working for money, volunteering as opposed to just sending money to that cause. And um, the E that it, that you know, so there's W first, then there's E. It's actually emotional energy, and this is actually one of the key pieces, I believe, of of a healthy retirement or or fulfilling retirement is understanding that. Your life is not is not really going to become uh, it's not going to be all that different from when you worked. You will still have struggles. You will still have detours in your life. Things may not work as well in some cases. It may actually work better in other cases. But your emotions are going to be a key part of of, of are, are with you forever. So you better given that there's more uncertainty when you actually get into retirement, you better become good at dealing with stress and your emotional volatility that uh, stressful events can cause in your life. And I think that's one of the chapters that with a lot of my readers and clients has re actually resonated the most because they never really thought about that. They never thought about, hey, I know my physical strength is actually going to diminish over time. But what I can do is control what goes up here in my head um, and kind of how I react to cir to changing circumstances in my life. So that's the second E. And then there is achievements. And achievements is nothing more than basically saying you have to have something to look forward to, whether that's looking out for your grandchildren or working for, uh, you know, in an environmental cause or starting a little side business or or stay at work till they <laughs> kick you out basically whatever whatever it is a hobby it could be a hobby it could be building a boat could could be you know any anything that makes you wake up in the morning and say today I'm gonna work on this today because I really want I I I love this this thing but I need to kind of look you know work on it so that's sort of the achievement piece. The L is for learning. I think learning doesn't have to be just book learning. It could be anything. And in fact, in today's world, with so many, so many, um, so many ways to learn online or university courses, or simply learning on your own. And uh, there's so much new stuff, for example, that I learn on YouTube. So that's the L, which is learning. And there's a lot of positive aspects to pushing yourself for mental health. Um, and then the T is what I call your tribe. This is the social side. And this side is, is, is well understood by people, but sometimes under underappreciated in terms of how much you really need to keep investing on the social side. Um, because your network, your social network will diminish over time. Uh, if you think about going from your career days where you went into an office, you had your friends in the office w that you saw for lunch or for, you know, you just spend five minutes talking about some <laughs> some event, whether it's mm -hmm. sports or politics or something, um, that when you actually take that out of your life, there's a void there. So you have to really look at your social network uh, in, a, in, a, in a dynamic way. Because while well, you can assume that your family and best friends are going to be around, everything needs to be, as Stephen Covey used to say, win-win. So you need to keep investing in those relationships. And you also need to make new friendships because a lot of the friendships that you thought were very solid in the past simply disappear or dissipate over time when you're no longer um, you know, working with that person 
or were there health issues involved or whether or if you move and distance is actually a huge barrier even in this day and age to keeping relationships going um so that's that's the tribe and then and that's the t for tribe and then the last one is your health and nobody disputes that you know basically how healthy you are has a huge impact on the rest of your life this net wealth framework is my way to basically look at your life almost the way you would look at a portfolio let's say of stocks and say it needs to be well diversified it needs to be balanced um, you need to invest in areas uh, or pay attention to areas where maybe things aren't going as well and you need to sort of monitor your life in a way that you know and that's through habits and lifestyle that um, your portfolio stays healthy so it's i think it's it's been a fun way to describe it to to people and it's a way that they actually also remember i actually got this idea too from somebody from hal elrod he started this movement this global movement that the morning morning miracle movement and it's actually he, his book is a massive bestseller but he came up with this acronym called the sabers and it basically every letter uh, stands for something that you should do first thing in the morning in your morning routine. So I thought, well, you know, I'm not as smart <laughs> as hell, but um, but I'll apply it to retired people or to people that are looking to, you know, are to their next phase in life. And they still need to to think about this idea that you need to invest in your life uh, to keep going and have the best possible set of outcomes i mean i, I loved it because term. it's um yeah it's a word that we all use and what most people think about when they think about finances net wealth but uh in fact one of our big investment platforms in australia is called net wealth oh but okay. using that as a an, an aid memoir to think about what you should be thinking about when you're talking directly to a consumer it struck me as being a stroke of genius and it's it does seem to encapsulate everything um obviously your book was written for retirees themselves so but how do you use this technique in your practice my practice has been primarily one-on-one coaching mm -hmm. um and in one-on-one coaching you start with i start with this framework but i tend to go to the areas where they're, they're in most need to be honest with you one thing that i'm doing in my practice i'm i'm in q1 of next year i'm launching a, actually a course an online course which will basically take the concept of the book and put it in a, in a in a course setting with examples and worksheets and actually sort of group coaching um that will actually more formally go through all the 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 nine the nine areas of your net wealth so I think the advantage of one-on-one -on -one coaching is that as a coach, you, you can figure out where you need to go, the great, you know, where the greatest sense of urgency is, uh, while still discussing the overall framework. But in group coaching, I think because it, you're not customizing it to one individual, you really cover the whole sort of pie, if you will, and and that's where sort of my group coaching classes and uh, will, will and my online classes will go and then sort of the third stage of the of the evolution um probably in along with the course is um uh, an online community um and i think the online community is where people are using this framework i understand the framework typically it'll be people that have gone through the course but actually are applying it themselves. And that's, I think, where the real power comes in because we all come with our own set of beliefs and biases. Um, and and, and, and in, even as a coach, while we try to be very agnostic in terms of, of you know, kind of the right and the right way of doing things, um, I, think, I think the power community, it really, really works when it comes to issues that a lot of times we think are unique, but in re but probably, this is a rough estimate, probably 90% of the time, most issues that you think are unique actually other people have had. 
and there's power in learning from other people and how they've gone through their evolution. So, for example, in the book, I talk about the role that my uncle has played in my life, and I, I, I refer to him as my retirement superhero. Mm-hmm. So I think sometimes we look at mentors, you know, and, and yep. the word mentor is not really used in terms of retirement. Mm-hmm. Real mentors is typically used, you know, with young people looking at somebody, you know, from a career standpoint. But I do think that um, kind of the concept of mentor or retirement superhero is one that visually can give you a much better roadmap. Um and again, incorporate sort of the framework, this net wealth framework, whether you actually, you, you know, you call your living situation your nest or something else. It's sort of immaterial. That the, the, the idea is that where you live, your lifestyle and your environment is really important. Um, you need to pay attention to that. Cool. Now, um, given that our audience are generally... Um advisors um what advice would you give to an advisor seeking to move from you know the traditional financial approach to retirement planning you know that about saying well this the dollars this is how we're going to structure an income stream this is how we're going to deal with these risks um to taking the more holistic view that you described in the book and the net wealth framework. What, what would you say to an advisor looking to to broaden? I think I think it's to their benefit. One of the issues that we face in the U.S. is fee compression, um, or you know, what's the value of an advisor? Um, and people, especially when 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 capital balances and the stock market is under stress, people question the value of an advisor. Um, and I think th- I think the evolution of the industry needs to be to provide these sort of value add services, charge for it, but where the value add is clearly demonstrated. If you think about the role of an advisor that incorporates some of these, let's say, retirement life coaching practices, it be- that relationship becomes a lot thickier. It's not just about the money. It's not it's not as easy to compare advisor A to advisor B when you're no longer just comparing the return stream that you got from one advisor to the return stream of another advisor. So it really becomes a way to really make your, your business more sticky, um, more longer term, um, and also, I think, personally, more fun. Because I think when you can translate, you know, every every profession, and, and I'm being 100% honest here, anything you do for a long period of time um, becomes a little routine. Um, and I have seen that among advisors that have been doing their job way too long. It becomes routine. The value added is not is not communicated as clearly to the customer. And I think as a profession, we just need to work a little bit harder to 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 make it more tangible and useful to the end, to the end consumer. But at, why why not at the same time make it more fun uh, and more sticky for for us as advisors? I think there's a win win here for for the industry. Does it reduce the number of advi- of clients that you can you can deal with? Is it more intensive? Yes, I do think I do think that it does reduce the number of advisors you can deal with, and um, and that's why I think the bulk. If you if you look at the the distribution of advisors and the, what they do under that uh, in their professional role, I think you'll find you'll always find the the bulk of the advisors dealing with the accumulation phase, because the accumulation phase is more scalable. It's more about the financial side and it's more about sort of, you know, the portfolio construction and the investment side, if you will. The the, the, the retirement phase involves more variables, in my opinion, 
And this is where the quality of the advice needs to be better, actually. There's less margin for error uh, in terms of advice. And, uh, and, and from a perspective of the advisor, there's got to be more selection, self-selection of what type of clients fit what your, what, what, what your value add is, what you're delivering. And so I think I think that's that's another trend that I believe will happen, which will be there'll be more, you know, I don't want to call this firing of clients, <laughs> but some clients will it will be clear that some some clients care primarily about the financial side, mm-hmm. in which case you could actually price price that accordingly. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's another sort of trend in the U.S. at least where there's more menu pricing as opposed to just one price, you know, for everything, um, whether you take advantage or, or, or not, um, there might be a menu of services that you that, that you offer where finan- the financial piece may be priced at a certain level, uh, but you don't get the other part. But I'm pretty much convinced that, um, that people need some hand-holding, people need some guidance, uh, just like an athlete, uh, if you look at the best tennis players are, around the world, basically their strokes, um, you know, Roger Federer's strokes are the same today. Uh, now, he's retired. He's actually a good example of this, but or maybe not the best example, but his strokes were are the same today as when he was 18 years old. But uh, he still had a coach, right? So, and a coach plays a different role. It's no longer, you know, hit your serve in a certain spot or hit it a certain way. It's really more the mental side or how the strategy of the game. I think this the same thing applies to every single person where what you need during your accumulation phase is different from what you need at this new phase of life called retirement. But I do think that that, that, that advisor needs to actually assume that they'll spend more time on non-financial matters and probably less time on financial matters because that's actually something that I have found in my practice that the more you actually get to know your clients, the less they talk to you about the, the financial side. But they, t- they do talk to you about their life and how and, and their plans and the financial side in a sense, if your portfolios and your strategies are properly constructed, um, kind of run themselves and are there for the pl- the planning phase is the- already in place. You're not debating that anymore. So, I mean, markets do change. You need to make adjustments. But I do think that that sort of the ratio of your time that you spend on non-financial size will increase if you adopt this model that I'm talking about where you, you adopt a more holistic approach. Eric's book is Reimagining Retirement, The Nine Keys to True Wealth, and it's available at Booktopia, Amazon, and all good booksellers. Um, Thank you for sharing that with us, Eric. Thanks, Vince, for having me, and and I hope that your audience finds this helpful. That was Eric Weigel, Certified Professional Retirement Coach, and there's just so much nectar in that discussion for advisors working or thinking of working with retirees. Whatever you choose to do, you're dealing with a person with a lifetime of achievement who with your help can expect to live a long, comfortable and purpose-filled life. So treat them as a person with their own set of fears and challenges to be conquered and dreams to be fulfilled, not just a portfolio to be managed. That's how you will deliver a differentiated service and build a successful business. That just about wraps up this special XY Advisor podcast mini-series focused on the Retirement Income Covenant and its implications for retirees and their advisors. Thanks once again to our series sponsor, GenLife, Without whom, we could not have brought you these insights. I'm Vin Scully, and you've been listening to the XY Advisor podcast. Bye for now.